Hello and welcome to this Idaho Reports Web Extra. This year, we at Idaho Public Television, along with debate organizers nationwide, saw a number of candidates decline to participate in debates or fail to respond to our invitations in the first place. As Federal Election Commission rules say we cannot hold a debate with just one candidate, we're allowing those who did qualify a chance to sit down with us for one-on-one -on -one interviews in which they can answer questions much like they would have received in a traditional debate setting. Republican Phil McGrain is running for his first term as Idaho Secretary of State. His opponent, Democrat, his opponent, Democrat Sean Keenan, didn't respond to our invitation to submit materials for consideration for our debate. Clerk McGrain, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Melissa. Why do you want to be Idaho Secretary of State? Uh, as you know, I've had the opportunity to be on Idaho Reports many times and talk about elections over the years. Um, I am an elections junkie. I love this stuff. I've had the great privilege of working with Secretary Denny and Secretary Yasursa over the years, um, helping make sure Idaho's elections stand out and that when people head to the polls, they can have confidence that their vote counts and it counts the same as everybody else's and that nobody is interfering with our elections in any way. And I think we really do have a great system here in Idaho. I'm proud to have been a part of it. I think it's great the work that the clerks and others do throughout the state. Um, and so I'm really excited about the opportunity to collaborate with the clerks throughout the state to continue to build on our elections, especially in a time where um, you look over the last two years, I think there's been more uncertainty and doubt than I've ever seen throughout my career. And so we really want to try and build trust in the system and rebuild the confidence um, both here locally and nationally. And it's not because of anything that's happened here, but certainly there are those doubts. And so as I've traveled around the campaign uh, trail, um, it's been great to engage with people and talk about our elections, how the things that we do behind the scenes that people don't realize, and hopefully um, expand information for voters and access for voters coming into the future. You say that there haven't been issues here in Idaho, but your two primary opponents disagreed on that with you. And you, of course, emerged victorious in that three-way primary. But what are you going to do if you're elected to ensure that people do have trust in this system? I think one of the biggest things, and we've been we've done a lot of this over the last uh, year or so, is providing tours, uh, handing out information uh, to voters. You know, one of my goals for the upcoming legislative session that you know I'm probably revealing early is uh, to try and get more voter information out to the public. So specifically, looking at trying to produce a voter guide, uh, both the Secretary of State's office and the County Clerk's offices. It's the most the most requested thing we get is where's my voter guide? Because we have so many people moving into the state from other locations that are accustomed to having that information. And I think that's a tool to both get information about who's running for office, like who are you gonna be voting for? Is there an election coming up? But it's also a tool to share information about what we're doing to make sure our elections run smoothly, whether that's opportunities for early voting, uh, opportunities to vote absentee, or where's your polling place? Where's your district information? This year is a great example of that with redistricting. Right? We're trying to get information out to voters, and I think having a secretary really engage with that outreach will be a big part of building that public confidence. And for viewers who aren't familiar, redistricting is the process of redrawing legislative district lines, and in some cases, those polling places and precincts, yep, precincts. change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in other states, election workers and elected officials have faced threats, been the subject of baseless conspiracy theories. Does your office have a role in actively combating false narratives that lead to those threats? I think um, the, the role of the office really is to try and respond and to provide information, you know, transparency. Uh, I know you've chatted with uh, Controller Wolf. He's a big advocate of transparency, so am I. We've really been engaged with, whether it's with the media or providing information out there. You know, like recently I talked to uh, the Ada County Central Committee for the Republican Party, and I was just sharing absentee data because it's important for them to see. You hear these narratives that go around about what happens, but right now statewide, uh, there are two Republicans requesting an absentee ballot for every one Democrat. And that's not the narrative that people hear. But it's because there are plenty of people who just have busy lives and this is the most convenient way for them to vote. And so I think getting that information out there and being open about things um, helps achieve that. 
<clears throat> um, I will say, you know, you know, what you mentioned in terms of what you're seeing across the country, we, st we do see that here. There have been threats to election officials here. Certainly, I've faced uh, threats myself. Um, and, but it's really important that we have people who are willing to put in the work to make sure we protect our system. I mean, our country really does depend on people having confidence in their elections, both confidence that their vote counts, but also confidence that the process and the system worked such that regardless of who wins, whether it's the person you voted for or not, that you can have confidence in the outcome at the end of the day, that it is a reflection of the will of the community, right? We always see the change of power, and I think this is one of the important things to facilitate is cooperation, whether that's, you know, all the statewide officials that are running, there's gonna be a lot of turnover at the state. Can we make those transitions work smoothly? And I think as a state we can, and I think we have a lot of good things going here in the state of Idaho. So I hope to be a leader in that space in terms of, I know you're a big advocate of civility and uh, just how good government can work. And uh, hopefully my career up to this point has represented that and it will as Secretary of State. Should the Secretary of State though be more proactive in fighting some of those threats that you and other clerks have faced or should that role be more reactive as as some of those narratives take form? You know, I, I guess I don't know exactly where you're going in terms of what you mean by being proactive. I do think voter outreach and getting information out to the public, you know, in my sense, that is part of the Secretary of State's job is to inform people about the elections and the opportunities. I think if we do that well, uh, a lot of this, there's always going to be some di level of disconsent discontent or dissatisfaction, right? Uh, we have a wide breadth of political views in our state. Um, you're going to navigate that, but I think by and large, you even still ask people here, people do have confidence. They do think our state's on the right track. And so we just need to continue to build on that. I think it, it's a disservice to some of the public if we try to focus all of our attention for one small group who is upset about something rather than making sure we're serving all Idahoans. You know, one of my goals is to serve everybody in the state regardless of the political stripe. Uh, I am a Republican, I'm running as the Republican nominee, but my intention is to serve all Idahoans as Secretary of State. One of the other important roles that the Secretary of State's office uh, fills is monitoring campaign finance, publishing the campaign finance information, and reviewing any complaints about the misuse of funds. Should those campaign finance laws have more teeth? In other words, if there are violations, should the penalties be higher? I think, you know, I'm, I've been very active in the space when it comes to campaign finance over the years. Um, it's almost been five years, I think, now since we had our first interim committee on campaign finance reform. And if you were to go back, I wrote a letter to all of the members of the committee describing what, what we really need to do. And we've seen some of it implemented. I helped work on that. But the first thing we need to do um, is focus on making it easy to comply. Everyone focuses on enforcement, and that's where they want to go, is like, how do we hold people accountable? And we should. But the number one reason is our campaign finance laws are currently confusing. I would like to see them refined and rewritten to make it easier. Most people, I talked to a constituent last night who, uh, it's one of the legislative candidates right now, their spouse is the person doing it. That's actually the most common campaign treasure, someone's spouse. And we have these complicated laws for them to follow. We need to make it simple for people to do the right thing. If we want them to do the right thing, make it easy to do the right thing. Then we need to focus on transparency. And as you know, working with Secretary Denny, uh, we made it so instead of going to 79 different websites and it locations all in one spot, I think we can continue to build on that transparency using technology to shed light on where money is coming and going in Idaho politics. And once we get those two pieces, then we can focus on, as you put it, you know, teeth in it, but enforcement. Um, I do think there are instances where certainly there isn't enforcement where there could be, um, but we need to get to a place where we're comfortable with it too. Too many candidates and campaigns want to like bludgeon each other with campaign finance violations. That's not how it should work, right? In some instances, if someone doesn't put a disclaimer, they should be fined, but it's just like getting a speeding ticket. We've all experienced that where, yes, we were breaking the law, we were penalized for it, and we move forward. It's not going to make or break anybody's campaign. The goal is transparency so the public can make informed decisions when they go to the polls, and that's what I'm going to try and achieve. The Secretary of State is also responsible for business services, you know, yeah. in, in incorporating uh, trademarks. Is there anything on this side of the Secretary of State's office that you would do differently? 
You know, it's one of those areas um, I'm looking forward to getting involved in. Uh, right now I serve as the county recorder. Uh, the county recorder complements the business side of the Secretary of State. Businesses work with the Secretary of State. Uh, property records, like homeowners, work with the county recorder. It's very, very similar functions. I think there's been opportunities with technology to provide more access, but I really want to give credit to Secretary Denny. Their office has done a great job of uh, improving the technology and access. Uh, the state gets lots of compliments by whether it's the legal community or the business community, banking, who uses that site regularly. So right now, from what I largely hear, it's working very well. Um, but as we continue to evolve and more technological opportunities come up, I'm hopeful we can continue to make it easier to do business here in Idaho. If you're elected, you'll also sit on the state's land board. Um, one of the lesser known roles for some of these constitutional offices, but a very important one. Um, seen a lot of recent attention because of the attempt to sell off parcels on Cougar Island, which is a popular sure. spot in Valley County uh, for those in other parts of the state. Um, is there anything that you would do differently as a member of the land board than what uh, those who have sat on there for the last four or eight years have done? I, it'll be interesting to actually get in there, right? I, I don't want to like prejudge any of the things, but one of the things that I bring to the land board, and I'm excited to do it, I think the level of engagement, I happen to be an attorney, right? Typically the attorney general is the only attorney sitting on the land board. Um, certainly when Secretary Sursa was there, he was also an attorney. Um, I bring that extra opportunity to have debate and dialogue over some of these. I will even say, you know, I'm kind of personally proud of it. Uh, I debated with Justice Horton in a bar once about land board policy, right? in terms of how to make these decisions, right? When you look at what the Constitution says in terms of maximizing the return for the endowment, but what does that look like? Cougar Island is a great example. Um, you saw this desire and opportunity that they saw to uh, get some money uh, for the endowment, but it didn't go as planned. That's very clear, right? And I think we really need to look at our resources and say, where are we getting the most yield? Where are some of the biggest political battles? You look at uh, grazing fees. There's a lot of political battles that happen over grazing fees but not a lot of money goes to the endowment that comes out of that. And I think prioritizing really focused on the beneficiaries and how do we ma actually maximize the return rather than getting into all these different disputes. And I think, you know, by and large, the land board works very well. Last, just this past year, the land board set another record in terms of disbursements to the beneficiaries. That means things are going well. So, it, you know, one of the things, I want to continue that success and I don't want to do anything to disrupt it, but we really do need to look at the long term in terms of how we invest that land and use it. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity being engaged in that area. Might that long-term discussion include uh, potential changes to the Constitution to change the way that the land board is allowed to look at that balance between the maximum financial return and also the uh, benefits to local communities or other factors? I think it could. I think it's an interesting question because I was meeting with Secretary Yasursa recently and he mentioned they've previously changed the Constitution trying to make it clear and one of his things is like it clearly didn't do what they had hoped it would do in terms of clarifying that, right? And so maybe there's an opportunity to review that. I also think how we work with local units of government, that's always a contentious issue in terms of property tax revenue loss, right? Especially in these small communities that really do need every dime they can to survive. Uh, you know. So much focus is on growth in our state right now, um, but there's half of our state that's shrinking, right? And people don't realize that. And coincidentally, uh, a lot of our public lands are in the communities that are shrinking, not the ones that are growing. And so we have to be a player in that because we are one of the large landowners. And so working, whether it's with the feds or others, and trying to figure out how do we balance the needs of those local communities and maximize the return for the endowment. Um, it could involve a constitutional amendment. I mean, I'm certainly, my head's not there right now, but I think collaboratively the board can work on some policies that will, will ultimately benefit everybody. Great. Ada County Clerk Phil McGrain, Republican nominee for Secretary of State, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.